Okay, so you guys might be asking yourselves, you know, why have we done all this stuff with symbolization? Um, besides the fact it's so incredibly fun, right? I mean, whatever. I, I, I do think it's kind of weirdly fun, like, figuring this kind of stuff out, like, you know, like a puzzle. I'm guessing some of you feel the same way. Some of you are like, you are such a weirdo, and why are you subjecting us to your weirdness, right? Well, anyway, it, I'm not just doing that, right? There's a more important reason. And that's because this... Um, Propositional logic is really useful for determining validity. Once you put an argument in the form of propositional logic, there's really nothing left but the form. You know, and logic's about form, validity is about form. Well, there are certain methods you can use to tell whether the argument's valid or not. So, just recapping propositional logic, pretty, you know, valuable for determining whether argument's valid. Valid, remember, means if the premises are true, then the conclusion must be true as well. Right? You know, and there's, there's intuitive ways of testing for validity. You know, can you imagine a way premises could be true, conclusion false? If you can't imagine a way, then pretty good sign it's valid, but it's not perfect, right? Maybe there's something you've just forgotten. So how do we determine if an argument's valid? Well, first thing we're going to want to do is translate it into the form of propositional logic. So let's, and how are we going to do that? Well, the way we always want to do these kind of things is just step by step, piece by piece, right? You know, if you try to just bite this all off, gulp it down at once, it's not going to work slowly, right? So, if the murder weapon was a pistol, then Miss Scarlet committed the murder, the murder weapon was not a pistol, Therefore, Miss Scarlet did not commit the murder. Well, you know, we, if we're going to put an argument in the form of propositional logic, we should just start the same way we did when we diagrammed an argument, right? Put the argument in standard form. You know, sometimes you might have to re rewrite the argument a little more than you will here. I basically wrote this one so you don't have to rewrite any of the premises. You know, putting this one in standard form, just let's just number things, right? You know, again, as we've seen, arguments are not always this simple. Sometimes to put arguments in propositional logic, you're going to have to rearrange things, but here you won't, right? So, we have these three sentences. If the murder weapon was a pistol, then Miss Scarlet committed the murder. The murder weapon was not a pistol, therefore Miss Scarlet did not commit the murder. I was writing some of these the other day, and I just remembered the old Clue game, so I got on a kick of Clue made it easy for me to write these, whatever. If you've never played Clue, well, I don't know. It's not like you're missing a huge life experience. If you have, it's probably triggering some memories, right? Well, first thing we want to do is how many propositions are involved in this argument? What are they? We want to give each proposition a letter, right? And all three of these sentences, there's really only two propositions, right? The murder weapon was a pistol. Miss Scarlet committed the murder. All right. So now let's actually translate all the sentences now that we have our propositions and the letters for them, right? If the murder weapon was a pistol, then Miss Scarlet committed the murder. P arrow S. The murder weapon was not a pistol. Tilde P. Therefore, Miss Scarlet did not commit the murder. Tilde S. All right. Now that we have this, we can just drop all the words and just look at the form of our argument, right? You know, we're just thinking about the form. That's what propositional logic is good for. So, premise one, P arrow S. Premise two, tilde P. Conclusion. These little three dots mean conclusion. You guys don't have to use them. Just always put them at the end. I just thought I would. They're kind of a pain in the neck to find on a lot of computers, a lot of programs, including, you know, Keynote for Apple, they're kind of a pain to find. So don't worry about them, but you know, whatever. I just thought nice touch, a little three dots means conclusion, conclusion, tilde S. Is this a valid argument? Well, one way to determine whether it is, is to build a truth table, right? And I've been throwing out truth tables without saying anything about building them, but let me just say something, right? For your first letter on a truth table, you're just going to alternate T's and F's. One T, one F, one T, one F, till you hit the bottom. 
for your second, you double how many times you do T, how many times you do F before you change off. Um, so P here is T, F, T, F. S is T, T, F, F. And, you know, well, if you had a third letter, what would you do? Well, you just double it again. You'd do four T's before switching to four F's. Well, how many letters do you need? Or so how, many how many of these rows do you need? When you have one letter, you need two. For each letter after that, it doubles. So for two letters, you need four. Three letters, you need eight. Four, you need 16. I'll say a bit more about that and why it's significant for how useful this method is in a minute. So we build our tooth table, right? When I did logic, we had to make, do a bunch of these by hand because our professor was an ornery old snot. I seriously didn't like the man. I won't start joking because I'll probably say legitimate me legitimately mean things. He was not a good teacher or a good person. But anyway, I managed to learn logic nonetheless. I think I'm a lot better teacher. God, I hope I'm a better person so you can learn logic too, right? Anyway, ba back to my point. So we build our truth table, right? Well, now how's our truth table going to help us determine validity? Well, remember validity, the truth table is trying to get every possible combination of P and S here, right? And so we have all our combinations of P and S, all the different things that, that could happen with them. And then we ask ourselves, it's like, okay, given all these combinations, is there a case where our premises are all true. Remember our premises we only have two, P R O S, not P, and our conclusion false. Well, you know, look. Let's look at the rows of our truth tables where our conclusions or sorry, our premises are true. And there are only two. Right? The second line And the last, right? And the last line is not a problem, right? Because premise is true, conclusion true as well. No problem, hey, yay, wonderful fun, right? But the second line, which I also have in red, shows that this is not a valid argument because the premises are true and the conclusion is false. You know, what's this case mean? Well, P is false, the murder wasn't committed with a pistol, S is true, Miss Scarlet did it, well, and our conditional is also true, our first premise, because remember, you know, a conditional says, well, if it was the pistol, Miss Scarlet did it, but it doesn't say if Miss Scarlet did it, she necessarily used a pistol, right? You know, maybe our detective knows that if it was done with a pistol, Miss Scarlet did it because she was the only one who had a pistol. Maybe she has one in her purse. But, you know, maybe she knows that people would be suspicious, so she used poison instead, right? Or maybe she's stronger than she looks, and she bashed in the guy's head with a candlestick, right? The conditional just says, if it was the pistol, she did it. It doesn't say, if she did it, it was the pistol. Remember with our conditional order matters. So there's a line of the truth table where these are all true. She was the only one who had a pistol, let us assume, so if it was done with a pistol, she did it. But it wasn't done with a pistol, but she did it because there's other ways she could have killed him, right? Conclusion is false. Because there's that possibility this is not a valid argument. If there's any line on your truth table where the premises are true and the conclusion false, then you know it's not a valid argument. Let's look at another one. Again, just another one taken from Clue. If Colonel Mustard didn't commit the murder, then Miss Scarlet or Reverend Green committed it. However, Neither Miss Scarlet nor Reverend Green committed the murder, so Colonel Mustard committed the murder, right? Same procedure, 
again, just same procedure for using, putting things in propositional logic form. You start the same way as you would for diagramming. You know, just put it in standard form. If Colonel Mustard didn't commit the murder, you know, one, two, three. I didn't reword this at all, so you know, I really don't need to read through them. Now we figure out how many propositions there are here. In our three sentences, there are three. Colonel Mustard committed the murder equals M. Miss Scarlet committed the murder equals S. Reverend Green committed the murder equals G. Now that we have those, we start to translate our sentences. Colonel Mustard didn't commit the murder. Well, that's not C, tilde C. Then Mrs. Scarlet or Reverend Green committed it. Well, Mrs. Scarlet or Reverend Green committed it is S or R. And between that, because we have the if then, there's the arrow. So tilde C, arrow, S, V, R. However, neither Miss Scarlet nor Reverend Green committed the murder. Not S or R. So Colonel Mustard committed the murder. Now, now that we have our translation, we can just drop all the sentences. If, you know, not C, arrow, S, V, R, tilde, parentheses, S, V, R, close parentheses, little conclusion sign, C. Well, is this a valid argument? You know, you might be wondering, you might be trying to think about it. It's like, well, oh, is it? Some of you will, you know, it'll be clear just immediately, but some of you might be wondering. Well, look, we can once again do a truth table, right? And I won't bore you with this, right? But remember, I didn't label the premises here, but remember our two premises are this conditional tilde C arrow S, you know, parentheses S V R close parentheses tilde, parentheses, S, V, R. And it turns out there is only one line on our truth table. If you go plugging in values here, there's only one line where the two premises are true. And on that line, the conclusion is also true. There's no other line where both premises are true. The only line where the two premises are true, the conclusion is true as well. This is, in fact, a valid argument. There's no set of circumstances we can imagine given these propositions where these premises don't show this conclusion to be true. Now look, I think it's good to give you guys the truth table method. We are going to use this very, very little. And we're going to use this very, very little because it is not useful. And it's not useful mainly because it gets so big so fast. You know, the number of rows you need doubles with each proposition in the argument, that is every letter. If you had five propositions, five letters, you'd need 32. Six propositions, you'd need 64 rows. Seven, you'd need 128. You know, we're not going to look at arguments that have seven or eight propositions. We are going to look at arguments that have three or four. And even for three or four, this starts to get big, you know? Gets to be a real pain in the neck to write. For a human, at least, it's really a pain in the neck to write these out. And they're really not a very good method because once they get so big and long, checking every row gets to be very, very easy to screw up. It gets to be very easy to miss something. You know, that's not something we want in logic. We want it to be precise. We want certainty. We don't want a method where it's very easy for a human to mess up. Now, actually, you know, for a computer, you know, a computer doesn't get bored. A computer doesn't overlook things. A computer doesn't ma mind that this doubles every time. You know, if you want a computer to check an argument, 
it's just going to draw a truth table in its little computer mind and run through it. Even if that truth table has thousands of lines, it'll do that. That's just not a good method for a human being, right? One thing I will say for you guys, thinking in that way, you can probably guess that all this stuff with logic is pretty important to the way computers quote-unquote think. You know, replace your true with the one, your false with the zero. Start to get binary, right? This is pretty key in like how computers quote-unquote think. I won't get into that because I'm not in computer science and you know if I start trying to talk about computers too much I'll say something stupid. But you know this whole method of logic really is important, was important for developing modern computers. So don't let anyone ever tell you that logic is useless and don't let anyone ever tell you philosophy is useless, right? All right. What we're going to focus on instead of the truth table, and we're not going to get too deeply into this because you can do a lot with it, but we're going to talk a little bit about natural deduction. Natural deduction is a much shorter and more reliable method. And you have to memorize a few things. I remember the first time I saw this, and again, my teacher did not make scary concepts in any way approachable. In fact, he wanted to scare you because... He was an incredible jerk. And this scared me. Right? It's like, oh my god, why are, we, why are we doing this? We have our truth tables. Those are just, you know, I can handle those. Why are we doing this natural deduction stuff? There are a few rules you need to learn. You're going to have to memorize a few things. But once you do, this is not super hard. At least the basic ideas are not. You know, it can get tricky if you had to do long proofs with natural deduction. I'm not going to make you guys do that, so don't worry. <laughs> 